<laughs> All right, take two. <laughs> Kate here, uh, long time no see. I've been, oh, I've been a little worn out actually lately, and I've been having some technical difficulties with my audio equipment. This is actually the second time I've tried filming this. Hopefully, I've managed to get it a little better. Uh, hmm. Yeah, my mic's my mic's not working at all. So, if anybody has any good mic suggestions, let me know down in the comments. I kind of want something that I can uh, connect to my camera and use for voiceovers be good to have one that could do both, but my voiceover mic right now is totally dead, so all the videos that I had planned or started on, uh, they, they just can't, can't be finished at the moment, and I'm kind of too tired to really do a whole bunch of work for a bunch more videos. So today I'm just doing a casual little video, and I'm going to talk about some interesting resources and one's not really a resource, but vintage resource related material. <laughs> uh, this is all stuff that I got for my birthday. This isn't like a birthday haul or anything. It's not everything I got for my birthday. Uh, but I did get some stuff that I thought might be of use or of interest. This, everything I'm going to mention is something that you can actually buy. Sometimes it's, it seems unfair if I buy like a, a historical book that is very rare or expensive or hard to get your hands on. Uh, like, there's not really much point in sharing that. I mean, you know, it's sort of like, look at this great thing I have that you can never own. <laughs> kind of, there's no point. Uh, but these are some interesting reference materials and related items that if you're really into uh, historical beauty or sewing or any of that sort of stuff, that you can actually acquire and it can help uh, doing your own research into these subjects and your own reading. I am a big fan of reading period sources. Most of my videos, I do not get my information from a secondhand sources. I gotta, don't take a modern book written about the past and get my information from there. I prefer to get it from actual period sources. There's a lot of those kind of things available on like archive.org or Google Books, and while those are really great, I like having a print copy. So that brings me to my first item on the list, which are these great reprints. I didn't know this was a thing until recently. As I mentioned before, I get a lot of books on archive.org. I do have some actual historical books, but I do use the archive.org books, like digitalized books, quite frequently because they're, they're really good. <laughs> they're great sources. But there's something about a print book. I... I'm not a digital book person. I don't have an e-reader or anything like that. I like real books, <laughs> and I have quite a few of them. But this is a new thing to me. I didn't know these were available. I don't think they're available in bookstores per se. I've certainly never seen them, but you can get these online. I actually found some of these are from Chapters website, and some of these are from Amazon. The actual company does have their own website as well. These are reprints of historical beauty books. So I have two brands here. I have Scholar Select and I have Forgotten Books. I've had a chance to look through both of these already and if you're interested in buying such a thing, I would recommend Forgotten Books. The print quality is a lot higher. With the Scholar Select books, you get a lot of pages like this. Like see, you can see the, the scan line along the corner. Uh, and there's a few, like, what is that? <laughs> Like, it's just the picture of the scanning. They haven't had any work to it. So some of these books, I, I got both brands because I wanted to see what the difference was. But if you look at the forgotten books, some of the print's a little hard to read. And that's just because it's historical print. That's to be expected. It's not nothing illegible. Uh, but you can see it fits the page a lot better. And none of those ugly scan lines, they've actually put work into putting them in an interesting book form. So I would recommend Forgotten Books over Scholar Select. Actually, this is the cheaper of the two as well. So <laughs> the ones that I have purchased for the, the Scholar Select one, I got Health and Beauty Hints and My Lady's Dressing Room. These are both, especially Health and Beauty Hints. This is from 1910. And I can't remember the year on this one. That's a Victorian one. But 
these are books that I have read online. They're, you don't have to buy these. You can get a digital copy off archive.org for free. But if you do want a print copy, uh, these are both excellent titles, especially Health and Beauty Hints. If you're interested in sort of that Edwardian period, this is a really good one. And then I also got in the, the uh, Forgotten Books series, I have The Ugly Girl Papers. <laughs> Okay, this is a personal favorite, and I gotta admit part of it's for the name. <laughs> this is another Victorian beauty book, and uh, I remember it being quite interesting. Again, this is all of these books available online for free if you don't want a print copy. This is just, I'm just letting you know you can get them in print form. Something like this, where it's not like a, a pharmaceutical book where it's just like recipe, 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 but it's a lot of text, a lot of text, so I find reading it in print form a lot easier rather than trying to read it on the computer or something. But The Ugly Girl Papers is a really great one, if only for the name. And then the other one I got was uh, Health, Beauty, and the Toilet, Lady... Blah. The other one I got was Health, Beauty, and the Toilet, Ladies to... L I can read this. Health, Beauty, and the Toilet, Letters to Ladies from a Lady Doctor. I haven't actually read this one. This is a Victorian one. But I had a little scan through of the copy I found online. This one does have some recipes as well. So it looked quite interesting. It's an interesting um, concept because it's all her answering letters. I don't think she gives the... Yeah, she doesn't give like what the question was, but she sort of says in response to your question about blah blah blah, here is what I recommend. I mean, these are not necessarily all safe. I just see a lotion here made with mercury. <laughs> but I thought this might be an uh, interesting read. So if there's any safe recipes, you might see some recipes from this in the future. And the other one I got, which is not beauty related, but which I thought I would mention, is I got a Victorian vegetarian cookbook. I really love uh, historical recipes. I myself am a vegetarian, so a lot of the meat-based recipes I cannot make. But luckily for me, vegetarianism, it, it was quite a thing around the uh, the turn of the century there in the Victorian and into the Edwardian period. So there's a lot of vegetarian cookbooks available. It was a, a fairly substantial movement. I don't know how many people actually went vegetarian, but it was it was enough of a thing that there's a lot of resources available. So. <laughs> I really like this one. This is, as I mentioned before, Victorian. Um, I can't remember the year on it. 1870-something? Uh, oh, sorry. 1892. So yeah. I haven't tried any of the recipes here yet, but a lot of them sound really delicious. There's lots of stews and soups. and I actually, I have to be gluten-free as well. And that's the problem with a lot of vegetarian cookbooks is that they're heavy on the wheat products, but there's enough things in here that either are wheat-free or that are easily adaptable uh, with some of the gluten-free flours or, you know, almonds or like almond flour, that kind of thing. So just, I just added this little extra one into the cart. This actually, I bought, this wasn't a birthday gift. I bought this one for me, <laughs> but yeah. So they have a whole bunch of different titles available. They're not just beauty books. Like I have this cookbook. They have other cookbooks. They have just general historical books of a variety of titles. Uh, there's some great needlecraft books that I really want to check out. They're, they might be on my uh, Christmas wish, wish list. It's a very interesting resource that I didn't know was a thing. I don't know how I didn't know this was a thing. This is like... I spent a lot of time reading this kind of stuff, so I didn't know how I didn't know that these were available, but they're really not that expensive. Some of these were only like $10. Some were closer to the $20, $30 mark, but there are some titles available for not a lot on, again, some of these were from Amazon and some were from Chapters. Forgotten Books does have their own website. Uh, they're based out of the UK, I believe. I didn't have time when I was ordering these. I was ordering them on behalf of like my mom and my grandmother as birthday gifts for myself, so I didn't have time to order from Britain and have it arrive in time. But you might want to consider ordering just right from their website rather than um, supporting like Amazon or something. <laughs> Just saying. So this next thing, these, I believe these are all from, oh, and I'm forgetting her shop name. It's Rumble Seat Cat. I think it's Rumble Seat Cat. I will, I will link everything I'm talking about down below. So if you want to check it out, she sells PDFs. She used to sell print books and I have a few of her printed books. Uh, they're reprints of 1920s books, mostly sewing books. 
She might have a few beauty books as well. I specifically was looking at her, her sewing books because I have quite an interest in historical sewing. I don't really talk much about it on here, but given how many requests I did get for that bra tutorial, which is coming, I just have to get my voiceover mic repaired. And I, we're sitting in my sewing room right now in my sewing studio because there's something I'm going to talk about next uh, that was too big to move in my usual filming space, but it's kind of a disaster in here. I'm reorganizing <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, it'd be good to just get my stash a little better organized and <gasps> okay, I did not really realize how big a task that was going to be. So things in here are a bit chaotic, but long story short, when this room is put back together, I will be filming that and when I can get a mic. Um, Oh yeah, I was, I was talking about the sewing book. Anyway, a lot of people seem to be interested in a sewing tutorial, so I would, I'm assuming some of you do sew. And these are 1920s uh, sewing books. Now, she only offers PDF forms now. As I said before, she did used to sell print books, but now she's only into PDFs. And while I like digital resources to a point, I like real books. <laughs> so I think we've already established so I had the idea of getting these printed and spiral bound just at the local copy center. I emailed her and asked her if that was all right. And she said, yeah, for, for personal use, you can have them, them printed. Uh, not obviously for resale, but because she's obviously done work scanning and cleaning these up. So the actual, this copy, not necessarily the material itself, but this copy of the material, she does have copyright over uh, given she has done a lot of work. For it. Uh, but these are really interesting. I have three illustrated home sewings here, or illustrated home sewing uh, issues here, and they're really great. They are, they're not very long. They're fairly short publications, but they are jam-packed with information. Some of them are full sewing projects, and then some of them are just, yeah, like see, we have an interesting cape here. And then some of them are little sewing techniques and tips and tricks. And we have, there's a lot of accessory patterns in here. The bra tutorial that I'm going to do is actually out of an issue of one of these. Uh, not out of this book, it's out of one of the reprints I got. But there's all kinds of fun hats and things. So they're not very long, but they are so jam-packed with information that I would, if historical fashion and sewing and that sort of thing is of interest to you, I would highly recommend checking them out. I will link, again, her Etsy shop below. The other one I got was the tailored lingerie, or sorry, ta tailored and lingerie blouses from 1921, which is a fairly um, large book all about sewing blouses, basically. <laughs> it's got every detail you could possibly want to know about early 1920s blouses and material and different variations, like different types of blouses you can make. So it's a really, really interesting read if you're into historical sewing. Getting it printed and bound was actually not that expensive. This is a fairly hefty uh, book. It's got the three in here, so I got tabs to separate them. Rather than getting individual ones printed, it was cheaper to do it this way, and I just got the tabs, because the, the illustrated home sewings are pretty small, so they, they all fit very nicely. I think with the spiral binding and the you know, nice cover. I could have gotten something printed on the cover, but I didn't bother. I think it was... I can't remember exactly how much it was. Less than 30 bucks? It, it wasn't too expensive to get it printed. It does add to your cost, like, because you're paying for the PDFs as well, but just if anybody has been looking at those really interesting sewing or knitting PDFs online and thinking, well, that's nice, but I want a real copy, <laughs> like a print copy, uh, getting them printed at a local copy center is a viable option as long as you have permission to do so from like the person holding the copyright uh, it's it's excellent it's not that expensive and it's a great way to have a like a physical resource to work from okay and the last thing i wanted to talk about is why we're sitting in the sewing room now it's a piece of furniture it is a new piece of furniture i don't often buy new furniture anymore i think in the last five ten years any furniture i've acquired with one or two very minor exceptions has been either second hand or a vintage piece or like an antique piece or free at the side of the road uh, behind me you can see my my uh it's covered with stuff at the moment but you can see my chaise back there that was an antique piece that i refinished and recovered it was 
It was always painted, okay? It really bothers me when people take gorgeous antique wood pieces and then paint them. This was already painted, so... <laughs> I didn't ruin anything here. It was always painted, too, and I took it apart. I was sort of looking at the original finishing under the re the uh, upholstery, and it, it was always painted. It was originally painted green, and if I had have known that before I bought the fabric, because I bought the fabric first, I would have painted it green and done a different material, but it was too late for that. Um, anyway, this isn't about that. <laughs> it's not about my lovely chaise. <laughs> it is about this piece down here, which I'm gonna have to tilt the camera down because you can't see it. Okay, I'm just gonna split and sort of splay myself across the top. <laughs> so this piece, this is a Alex drawer from Ikea. As I said, I don't buy modern furniture much anymore, and going into Ikea, which I used to love as a child, <gasps> it was so busy! I'm not used to shopping at these places. I like I like my quiet little antique stores. <laughs> but anyway, I did look for a vintage slash antique alternative, or just any sort of alternative, and I haven't been able to find a drawer unit that functions in the same way as the Alex drawer. So I've wanted this thing since, like, I don't know, high school, elementary school. I've wanted this thing for absolutely years. And I'm so happy to finally have it. I'll just move that book out of the way. Uh, some people buy these to store their makeup in or their art supplies. It's got very shallow drawers. But what I bought it to store is, roll that back so you can see that a bit better, my antique magazines. The Alex drawer, if you're an antique magazine collector, if you have more than a couple issues, you know what a storage challenge it can be. You can't store them upright on a shelf like books without worrying about damaging them. And if you have them deep in like a, like a dresser drawer, like I used to have mine, it can be very hard to find what you're looking for. They... They're, I mean, they're prone to damage. A lot of these are like a hundred years old, so you don't want to be rifling through them. Uh, you're, you're risking um, shortening their lifespan, damaging them. So... The Alex drawer is great because the, short, the drawers are so shallow that you can divide them up so you only have a few magazines per layer. It makes it a lot easier to find stuff, it eliminates damage. It's also great for, I have some of my antique photos over here. I'm going to go through drawer by drawer in a second to show you what I have in here. But it's perfectly sized. I have some of these larger old antique magazines and it fits them perfectly. Uh, there's only one layer that I couldn't fit in. Uh, I guess you would call that vertically lengthwise with... I guess lengthwise, like, chipped in that way. So much better. Oh, so, so, so much better. Bottom drawer I'm leaving empty on purpose because I would like to be able to have room to expand my collection for later. I think at the moment I have a few things from when I first started collecting, which you can't see at all, uh, that I'm going to sell. I have some uh, knitting books from the 1940s and sewing patterns from, like, the 60s and stuff, which used to be of interest, but I've I since discovered, while well, I find those decades interesting, they're not really my decades of choice, and I have no intention of ever knitting any of those books, so I might, I might pass those along to somebody who would appreciate them more than me. Bottom drawer here, which you can't see at all. Let me, let me, let me adjust this. I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to speak quickly so that I have... I put a new memory card in, but it's almost full too, so... I have my antique postcard book in here, which I'll put, link the video that I show you that in more detail. I have an antique sewing book here. Underneath I have my extra magazine bags. I bought these, I think these came with the Amazon purchase, I mean, like I ordered them with that. They are life size, as in the magazine life uh, bags, because that's the largest size available. They're acid free and archival quality, and it just keeps the magazines a little better. It helps protect them. Uh, if there's any sort of musty smells, it helps contain that as well. And I find it makes it easier to flip through, because you don't have to sort of... Um, you can just grab like a whole magazine really quickly, rather than like carefully trying to figure out where the bottom of it is in the pile, so you don't bend or crease anything. So in this next drawer, I have my, my uh, vintage sewing patterns. This is actually a great unit for storing sewing supplies as well, so I have all my historical... Uh, I, I think the oldest one in here is probably from the 1940s, but I have my old sewing patterns here. I have these great... these were actually another birthday gift, these Needlecraft magazines. I will link his shop below, because I want these to go to a good home. He has a whole bunch more of these, uh, and they're kind of being marketed to people who will cut them up and sell the ads, which uh, horrifies me. Uh, somebody who collects old magazines. I can't afford to buy any more than I already have. I have two here, and I'm getting two more for Christmas. 
but I would like them to go to a good home. So I will link those so you can you can find them uh, in the description if you're interested in that. They're often like the, I think he had some from the 30s, but a lot of them are from the 20s and a couple from the teens. Next door up, more magazines. This is my 1940s through to the 1950s pile. I think most of them are 40s with one from the, the 50s. Big pile of 1930s magazines. That's, um, that was what I collected quite a bit there for a while. This drawer that I showed you already, I have my 20s and um, 20s and older magazines. I think there's only a couple here for the 1920s, but some of them are Edwardian and I have a Victorian one hanging at the bottom. All my old Hollywood star photos. So we got like Mary Pickford and Colleen Moores right there. Uh, is that Dorothy Gish? So again, all in nice plastic uh, protectors. And then the top drawer, how much time? I got like two minutes left on my memory card talking quickly. I have my old antique photos. So these are, I don't know any of these people. I just got these at antique stores. Somebody who collected these and referred them uh, referred to them as her found family, which I always quite liked. Uh, as in, she, you know, they've just sort of been abandoned at the antique store, and she kind of adopted them. So I have quite a quite a collection of antique photos. And then, oh, I'm almost out of space. Give me a second. Okay, I put another new memory card in. So hopefully, I can talk without like rushing quite so much. I still only have like a few minutes left. Um, so in this top drawer, I have, as I showed, my found family here, all these lovely old antique photos. Again, I have them all in plastic, uh, partly to make them easier to flip through and partly for their own protection. And then here, here I have something, um, I'm, I'm glad I saved them, but it makes me sad that I had to do it in the first place. This is a pile of disemboweled magazine bits. <laughs> so these are all, I think they're ladies home journal sections. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. There's a one or two covers in here that say, these are what is left over from people who sell magazine ads. Now, when I first started collecting, I did buy magazine ads because I thought, oh, that's so cool. You can get, you know, these little bits of the past. And I found them very interesting. The problem with that is to get the magazine ads, the magazines in which they came from have been destroyed. And most of the time, I would suspect they end up in the garbage. It is very, very rare that you see something like this. I bought these at an antique store for like five, ten dollars. It's a huge pile of them. They're from a bunch of different magazines. And they're the leftover bits. They're the bits from the magazines that have been disemboweled. <laughs> And I, I bought them partly because I felt so sorry for them and I wanted to save them. There's tons of great information in these. Um, this top one's about scented, oh, stenciled pillows for Christmas gifts. And there's fashion articles and there's, you know, different, different questions and answers and all kinds of historical information stored in these. And... It makes me sad when I see the magazine pages for sale. And I can understand why people do it. They make more money doing it than selling the antique magazines. There's more money in individual ad pages because people hang them up for art than there is in full magazines. But I can't help thinking of everything that's been lost in order to get those magazine pages. How much information and little bits of history have just been thrown away. And who knows if other copies of those magazines exist. When you get something like this, it's, uh, some of this is over a hundred years old. It's very well and good to say, oh, well, you know, I'm sure one exists somewhere, but I don't know how many people actually check that there's still an archived thing of, now these are a fairly popular magazine, but some of the lesser known magazines, you have no way of knowing how many still exist in the world. And it makes me really sad that people still chop them up or use them for like scrapbooking projects. Do not buy old magazines for scrapbooking projects. That kind of brings me back to... <laughs> I kind of rushed through it because I was running out of room, and I still only have a few minutes left on this card. But um, If anybody wants to go to the store and buy his Needlecraft magazines, I really want somebody to buy these that appreciates them, and I want them to go to a good home. I don't want to see more pieces of history cut up. 
and turned into something disposable. I see people buy these and then like cut them up for their collages. Like, are you kidding me? These are like 100 years old. These are in some cases irreplaceable. Don't do it. <laughs> Hopefully this video is kind of interesting. I know this is kind of a little different, uh, more casual video. I do get requests for casual videos, but every time I try to film a casual video, it doesn't go well. I'm not very articulate and I'm aware of it and I tend to record them and then just delete them. I have a lot of, I, I think most of the videos, I think one in three just in general never makes it to my channel because either I'm not happy with it or uh, it was so sad. I filmed a big declutter, which I actually kind of liked. I, I didn't mind it, but I lost a whole bunch of the footage and I don't know where it went. So that one's never seen the light of day. And there's other ones that just... Uh. So anyway, hopefully this one's like not too bad. This is my second time filming it. I tried filming it earlier and it was really rambly and not that great. So I'm re-recording. Um, although it's sad. In the last video I filmed, I had my cat behind me. <laughs> she was sleeping on the chaise. So this video is obviously not going to be quite as good, <laughs> because how can it be as good without a kitty? <laughs> I don't know where she is. She's sleeping somewhere else, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, kind of got off track there. Right at, right at the end, just whoosh, left turn. <laughs> so anyway, um, my video schedule, as I mentioned before, might be a little hit or miss for a while, just between technical difficulties. And I'm, I'm just feeling a little burnt out at the moment. It's not video specific. It's not like I'm just burnt out from YouTube. It's just life in general. <laughs> So I'm sort of taking a step back from everything that I can take a step back from. Um, which is really sad because I just launched a Patreon campaign. <laughs> Nobody signed up for it yet. I haven't actually mentioned it. I've linked it down below, but I haven't actually mentioned it. Though I might post a video later this week about it. I'm going to try to keep up with two videos a month, though. Instead, instead of the four videos a month that I aim for, I'm going to at least try two videos a month. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope my little book and furniture tour um, maybe provided a little bit of useful information or inspiration and I don't know I hope this wasn't too boring <laughs> kind of feel like it was but anyway thank you for watching please don't forget to comment like subscribe if you want to and I will see you guys next time bye I don't know what's going on with my hair today when, when, when is this <laughs> <laughs> sticking straight out. <laughs> down. Down, boy, down. <laughs> what you doing? Just hanging out on the stairs? You could have come and joined me for the video, you know. Yeah. We like seeing you. Yes. Ugh. I'm kinda tired. I hope I hope this light is bright enough that you can't see you. <laughs> don't need foundation, girls and boys. You just need a really bright light. <laughs> it blurs everything. <laughs>